Okay. We're going to get started. So if you could cut the chatter, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. So, you know, the purpose of this session is uh, to just sort of have a discussion, and, and I mean a discussion. So if anyone has any questions at any stage uh, of this session, stick up your hand. Lena, yeah. uh, do we have the, you know, we, we've got the mic here. So this is what I want this to be. I want this to be a session where the three of us uh, impart uh, information, answer your questions, uh, give you information that can be of practical use uh, it, it, you know, when you're uh, conducting uh, investigations, uh, intelligence uh, operations, or, or whatever. So really, if there's anything you want to know about the offshore world, feel free to stick up your hand uh, and, and fire away. You know, I really want this to be, uh, to be informal. So, you know, I'm an investigative financial journalist. Uh, I launched Offshore Alert in 1997. And uh, my, uh, one of my marketing people asked me, for, for marketing purposes, how, how many frauds has Offshore Alert exposed? And I, and I, I dismissed her out of hand, saying, I mean, man, that's way too much work to have to actually go through all of our, you know, our stories and make a determination on, on you know, whether we actually exposed this or just reported on something that had already been exposed. I ended up doing it, and uh, so it's in excess of 175 uh, offshore frauds. I mean, it's got to the stage where I can you know, detect a fraud in seconds. It's pretty easy. My company routinely sends researchers to uh, registered agents and regulatory authorities um, in offshore centers to uh, 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 obtain information that any member of the public is legally entitled to. And I'll be going into this during the session. It's quite depressing the number of times registered agents uh, will refuse my researcher who I, I instruct them not to let people know they're working for Offshore Alert because I just want to see whether they're given something they're legally entitled to. And it's depressing the number of times where the registered agent will just say, you're not having it. You know, and, and, and then they come to me and then I will call the registered agent and say, uh, you know, I'm David Marchant of Offshore Alert. You know, we can do this the easy way or the hard way. You know, and they will all provide immediately provide the information, you know, because the law is is, is an ambiguous. So, so that that's me, and uh, with me on stage uh, we have you know Don Fort, who uh, you heard uh, first thing this morning. He's the chief uh, of the IRS Criminal Investigation Division, based in Washington D.C. And we have Donald Toon. Um, Oh, I love your title, the uh, Director of Prosperity, uh, Economic Crime and Cybercrime uh, for uh, the National Crime Agency, and he was previously uh, HMRC's Criminal Investigation Director. So um, I'd like to start with Donald, because he was in the news recently, uh, quoted uh, uh, by various news organizations um, as having some comments that you know, were somewhat critical of the Cayman Islands um, that, you know, I'm paraphrasing here, but uh, they were possibly being, you know, less than fully cooperative uh, when requests for information uh, were made. So um, perhaps, Donald, you could, you know, expand on, on those quotes. Certainly very, very happy to do that. Um... So this all stems for us from an exchange of notes between the UK government and the Crown Dependencies and Overseas Territories from the UK-led anti-corruption conference in 2016. Now, that exchange of notes commits both sides to provide um, accurate beneficial ownership information on request within 24 hours and that information should be capable of being used for criminal or civil litigation. Um, there, is some, there is some variation in the quality of responses, uh, but by and large, the overseas territories have responded extremely well 
and we have had some incredibly useful and valuable information back from them. The comments I made were very much focused on um, a, change, a change of position, perhaps, by Cayman, um, and a concern about, um, about the issue of the use of public registers of beneficial ownership. Um, and it's worth saying that um, it's worth saying that we've had and continue to have an ongoing constructive dialogue with the Cayman authorities. I think we can get, probably get ourselves into a position that they are, we believe, meeting the um, meeting the same sort of gold standard as some of their colleagues. But fair to say, um, they were not matching the standard uh, of the best. We expect to see that improve. And we have really strong engagement and commitment from the Cayman government to make sure that it does. And it's just worth probably highlighting. I mean, so we're, we're sometimes asked about how much use we make of these requests. Um, I, can't put an, I can't put an accurate figure on it, but I can make it clear that since mid-2016, so just over two years, we have made you know, some hundreds of requests into the offshore territories and, um, and the Crown dependencies, and overwhelmingly, we are getting good, strong, and clear responses. So, so could you maybe give us a hint uh, as to what the issue was with Cayman? Was it slowness in responding? Was it, like, ignoring? Was it incomplete information? Is there anything you can expand on while not breaching any rules or regulations? So I think the easy thing to say would have been that the, issue, the issues for us were, were very much around... around um, Speed, completeness. Uh, uh, and was that a change? In, you know, were they doing it tactically, or, or was this just a continuing issue? I think that's something you, you very much have to address with the, the Cayman authorities. Um, there was a point at which the, the UK government um, made it clear an intention around the future use of public beneficial ownership registers, um, and I think that that may have led to some reaction. So, uh, Don, uh, when the uh, U.S. authorities um, are looking into something and the evidence trail leads offshore, what is your experience in terms of uh, the speed with which you typically get a response, the um, whether the response is adequate, the quality of the information, and so on. So, so uh, you know, back up, back up a little bit, because I just give you a little bit of context on, on typically how we handle international investigations, because I think that'll, that'll kind of help, help frame the answer. So, you know, I mentioned this morning the resources that we have. Um, you know, little known fact, we're the only part of the IRS that has employees stationed overseas. So we have uh, what we call attachés. So we have about uh, 20 agents that we place strategically around the world, uh, two of which happen to be here today. Dan McWilliams and Tony Cook are attachés here in, in London and cover many countries. But obviously we, we have about 20, you know, 20 agents, 10 locations. They have to cover the entire world. So the, the reason why that's uh, important is those relationships that they form uh, with their law enforcement counterparts is part of how we get information. You know, from law enforcement to law enforcement, there's also, when we're talking about tax cases, there's tax treaties, there's MLATs, um, you know, the, the various legal tools that we go through, and, and again, working with the prosecutors in the U.S., with, with uh, the Department of Justice, you know, those legal mechanisms. But a, but a large part, you know, many, many cases that we work have an international component to them. And to us, you know, it's invaluable to have resources placed, you know, internationally, you know, to, to meet and know their FBI, HSI, DEA counterparts, because uh, there, there's a lot of ground to cover, obviously, being only in 10 countries. You know, so we, a large part of that work is, is building relationships and trying to understand how the various jurisdictions work. Um, but, you know, in terms of which jurisdictions, everything, it just, it varies, you know, depending on what the jurisdiction is, what we're asking for, um, you know, in terms of cl completeness, it just, it really varies by jurisdiction. I can't really be specific as to, you know, specific countries. So, so are you generally satisfied? 
Well, I could say that, that in many times we are satisfied, and if we're not satisfied, there's, you know, mechanisms to follow up to ensure that we continue to push the issue until we, you know, get as far as we possibly can. So, 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 so just as a journalist, you know, I, I typically get a sort of deer in the headlights uh, response uh, when I contact registered agents or send somebody around. And uh, one registered agent, an attorney actually in the Cayman Islands, provided me with a fraudulent copy of a share register. And, and under Cayman law, you know, for resident companies, um, any member of the public is uh, entitled to uh, a, co a copy of a share register. They're also entitled to inspect the share register. And typically, you just rely on the honesty of uh, the registered agent to provide you with a copy. You know, just leave a copy out front, you pay a statutory fee, and, uh, you know, it's uh, minimal time and, and fuss. And I was looking into uh, Cedrus Investments, basically a securities fraudster. He's actually banned by FINRA from the US securities industry for life. That's how bad this guy is. He closed, uh, he has a number of uh, FINRA arbitration awards against him and, and judgments. Some of the uh, judgments and awards, uh, uh, one was uh, for elder abuse. Uh, where he specialized in churning client accounts, and he'd done that you know, in, for some of his elderly clients. And there were substantial judgments against him. There were judgments in favor of employees. I mean, he's just an all-around bad guy. He just closed down his shop in California, his investment group, left behind the liabilities, just moved the assets to the Cayman Islands and set up Cedrus Investments, C-E-D-R-U-S Investments, if anyone wants to look it up. And so I, I, I found out that uh, Cedrus Investments was a resident company. I'm entitled to see the share register. I sent somebody around. They, he provided a copy. And I could tell from experience that the copy was, was not a, a genuine copy. And he, uh, on the front page, he, the, the document bore his corporate stamp. It bore his signature. Uh, it, it was essentially notarized as being a, a, a true and accurate copy of the original. But I could tell that it wasn't because the, the column for uh, the share certificate number, for example, you know, every share, uh, every share certificate has, has a unique number, you know, one, two, three, four, five, etc. The column was there, but the, uh, the nominee shareholder that was the only entry on what was provided, the share certificate number wasn't there. So I guess that, okay, that, does, that looks suspicious to me. So I sent the researcher back to actually inspect the physical copy, and we have a second physical copy that's notarized by the same guy, and it's materially different to the one that was first provided. The, the original uh, uh, document has the, the fraudster's name on it. So he had provided me with a fraudulent copy in the first instance to, that omitted the name of, of the fraudster who was really the beneficial owner of, of, of the company. This is pretty serious fraud. This guy is an attorney. I complained to the Cayman Islands Law Society, um, and they said they were powerless to act. And to this day, this guy has not even had a, a mild slap on the wrist. When it, you know, In the United States, I would suggest, and, uh, and the UK, he would probably you know, be disbarred in the United States or struck off... Uh, the role in, in uh, England and Wales, um, and to this day he still sits as a council member, no less, of, of the Cayman Islands Law Society. And this sort of gives you an indication, and this is certainly my experience, of the general mentality of offshore centres, uh, uh, particularly the registered agents. Um, you know, I've got recordings of registered agents uh, refusing, you know, these are undercover recordings, refusing my researchers, uh, information that they are entitled to. There is a basic sort of culture of, I'm not giving you anything. Yeah, that's my experience. And, and, and it's only if you become um, aggressive, and when I say aggressive, just exercising your legal right, you know, um, which is uh, considered to be sort of impolite in, in uh, the offshore uh, centers that I, uh, many of the ones that I deal with. So there is this sort of general culture, and this is why I was particularly interested. I mean, 
listen, I'm a, I'm a minion, right? They, they, you know, they might deal with me, you know, differently to because of the potential consequences. And so I have, you know, I, I can show you these uh, copies where it was just, it, this guy did this as easy as breathing. He provided me with uh, a fraudulent, you know, document and thought nothing of it. Um, so I was curious about, you know, the sort of, it's one thing cooperating, you know, if you ask for beneficial owners, uh, and, and it's another thing, no, you know, knowing that the information is ac actually accurate. Um, you know, have there been any cases where you, uh, uh, you found that the information that had been provided was, was, was um, trying to be careful with my words here, either false or um, misleading? So, so I can't think of any, you know, specific cases, but, you know, when you talk about, you know, it escalates to the point where, where you're reaching out to them directly. For us, again, it's, we're investigators, you know, we're, we're special agents, we investigate the crime, we present the facts of the crime to the Department of Justice. We don't do that negotiation with the international government, so it's, it, it, if, if that was the case it would be elevated, you know, it would be within your legal right would really be the Department of Justice would be, you know, maybe an investigator looks at the information that's provided and says, hey, this doesn't look right, uh, would present it to the Department of Justice who would then, you know, make the follow-ups through the proper channels legally, so. I think the worst thing is probably worth it picking up from a UK perspective is certainly our experience to date has been that we've had almost nothing in the way of significant issues about the quality of the information that's come back to us. <clears throat> and perhaps some of that is that this is, this is information that is very clearly for use in evidential purposes. And that means, of course, that we are likely to be cross-checking and testing information. So, something else on this general subject, you know, what is a, a uh, register of members or share register, as it's uh, more commonly known? Uh, I came across an example recently where I sent my researcher to the office of Estera in Bermuda, which is a, a registered agent, corporate service provider, to uh, obtain a, a copy of um, a register of members that I'm, you know, anyone, any member of the public is legally entitled. And we got into this weird situation. So a, a register of members is normally um, uh, identified in a law and described specifically as to what, you know, when laws are passed, you know, th th there's a, a sort of glossary that explains what all the ma major terms are. And a register of members will, will typically be described as, you know, a, a register of all members, past and present, and, and um, where they are passed, there will be, uh, there should be the date that they cease to be a member. So, uh, and these are, these, are, these are books, you know. So Estera in Bermuda has this bizarre policy where they only treat uh, a register of members as being the current members. So you could make the request on, on a Monday. Uh, they could alter it, you know, shortly thereafter, and then provide you with a copy a few hours later, and, and it just would, compl would contain whatever information they wanted you to know. Um, which, you know, I, uh, the registrar of companies in Bermuda said that a register of members, even though it's not defined in Bermuda law, um, must contain members past and present, which is just common sense. Estera Bermuda, which... Uh, used to be part of Appleby, and I think it was spun off in a management sort of buyout. Um, and I th think uh, the Paradise Papers leak was, was basically a partial leak of, of Estera or Appleby Corporate Services, whatever it was known as at the time. And they also uh, came up with something else. The registrar of companies in Bermuda told me, so one, it must contain past and present members, and they must have a, there must be a physical document, you know, a ledger, a book, where uh, all of this information is contained. Estera doesn't work like that. They just have it on, their, on a computer screen. Um, and the registrar of companies said, that's basically illegal. Um, and so, you know, 
for those who are investigators, you know, you, you might want to bear that in mind um, when you are requesting, you know, copies of documents. Uh, you might not be getting what you think you're getting, and it, it, you know, it, it could be a case of you, you know, registered agents acting, uh, you know, illegally, or, or certainly in, in a grey area. Yeah, we have a question here. Just quickly to follow up on that, as from a UK perspective or from a US perspective, if you're asking for information such as uh, beneficial ownership information, do you also ask for the underlying documentation, <coughs> such as in the case uh, that David is talking about, where the underlying uh, information must exist somewhere, i.e. who were the previous shareholders, but wouldn't be available uh, in a regular who's the beneficial owner question? So, so from our perspective, um, <clears throat> what matters is that we have the information in a usable format, which means that either we're looking at the underlying documentation provided to us or we're looking at someone who is in a position to make um, a, st a statement to that effect, and that statement's unchallengeable. Yeah, and I would say it's, uh, it, it's been many, many years since I've done this myself, but as a general rule, we're, we're very exhaustive in the information that, we, that we're requesting. So as much underlying information... Um, that's, that's part of how we build our case with evidence. So I think we're very exhaustive in the requ requests. So uh, mutual, assistance, mutual legal assistance treaty requests, um, is that something that uh, goes to the DOJ and, they, and then they do those on your behalf? Yeah, so typically on those cases, these are, you know, I, I won't get too sidetracked with, with how the investigations work, but we're, you've got an IRS special agent working with a DOJ prosecutor, and it will lead to a jurisdiction uh, in which we'll have to do a, an MLAT, and the a, typically how it works in practice is the agent and the prosecutor will, will help draft this, this document, put the required information in there that's required legally. It goes through le various levels of review within the Department of Justice before it's presented to the, you know, to the foreign government. So once it's presented to the foreign government, and, and I'd like you both to uh, answer this, um, so typically, sort of how long does the process take? So I, I monitor such requests that are made at U.S. courts, and it's just uh, amazing that uh, an application for the appointment of a commissioner uh, 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 to collect the evidence being requested will, will be made, and the court will uh, sometimes grant it the same day, or you know, it's typically within you know, one or two days. Is that the case in, in offshore jurisdictions? Yeah, so, so I think you almost answered the question. It just it varies. In, in some cases, we get information back very quickly. In others, it, it requires, you know, we may get a follow-up, you know, question from a foreign jurisdiction months after we make the request. So then we have to follow up with additional information. So, you know, it can be days, like you mentioned, or it can be, uh, in some cases, over a year. For the information, it just depends on the, jurisdi the jurisdiction, the type of case, the type of information we're requesting. Are you generally happy with the speed? Well, I mean, we're you know investigators. We always you know we want the information today, and anytime you're working, if we're working a case domestically, you know we have a lot of ability to get information from banks and witnesses quickly because it's all within our control within the U.S. Anytime we have to go overseas and there's other legal obstacles it takes a little bit longer to gather that information. So I'd say generally, you know, we're, we're, I think, satisfied with the speed. But again, it totally varies, and I can't even mention specific jurisdictions. So. And D Donald, what's your experience? So certainly it varies. It varies hugely. Um, so <clears throat> if we're looking within Europe at the moment, European investigation order, we'll be able to get information clear evidentially very quickly, um, usually dependent Depending on the level of urgency that we attach to it, that'll be days or weeks. Um, if we talk to, talk to beneficial ownership information in the offshore territories, then absolutely we'll get that quickly. And then it varies. It varies massively. And one of the factors um, that, that does have an impact is the extent to which you are able to prepare the ground with the other jurisdiction. The level of engagement that you have, and this is where Don's comments earlier about, um, about the value of in-country relationships is hugely important. So if you, are, um, if you are able to work closely, and we have liaison officers 
uh, accredited to over 160 countries. If you're able to use those relationships, then you can prepare the ground, you can make sure that as it goes through as a, as a legal assistance request, as it goes to court in that country, that there is someone prepared to receive it, that are prepared to do the work. So there is a trade here, and that trade-off, of course, works in the other direction as well. Most of these jurisdictions will look for information from us. That was actually going to be my next question, you know, because uh, in the context of obtaining, you know, offshore, you know, the issue of cooperation, there's this sort of tendency to automatically assume it's, you know, big countries requesting information of, of the offshore centres. How frequently, if, you know, do offshore centres come the other way and, and request information of your authorities? Is that rare? Is it it's not unheard of. It, if you, it depends very much on how you define offshore centres. We get international letters requests, MLA requests, that come into to the UK Central Authority and pass on to us very, very frequently. Um, often those, that will be a, a number of, it could be easily be a number of requests on a daily basis. And it depends very much on, it depends very much, I think, on the extent of our relationship. A lot of those requests come in because we have a relationship because there has right. been contact with us and people know that we have information and the information that we'll be able to provide for them. So I don't know whether you'll be able to answer this or not, but has the BVI ever made a single request under an MLAT for information, either in the, you know, the, to your knowledge, if you're able to answer it, you know, in, in the UK and the US? I can't get into speculation around, yeah, around an individual jurisdiction. <laughs> So, so are, you, are you sort of, you know, uh, again, you know, there are so many rules and restrictions. Whenever, whenever I have anyone, you know, uh, uh, from authority here, you know, I, I feel for you. Because you know, I'm sure you must, you know, deep inside, you know, must be ready to burst, you know, with, uh, you know, your information. But you can. Um, so, but, but so general, you know, generally, is, or not you specifically, but is there a general satisfaction or... or, or a general dissatisfaction? Yeah, are you able to sort of give me anything? Again, I, you know, I think it varies, and I go back to, uh, you know, the, there's a difference between, you know, kind of the, the police to police where the liaison officers yeah. and, and the attaches are, are getting information versus legal requests. And I think, you know, to get to the, the answer that, that Donald gave about are requests coming into us? I mean, yes, I, I think requests are constantly coming into the United States for information, but that's not something that that, but from offshore that we centers see. Or, or from you know major countries. I think mostly major countries, but I don't. I, my point was going to be that we don't see those. Those don't come directly to the criminal division of the IRS. So. I can give you a funny anecdote, actually. Uh, so you know, offshore alert monitors uh, request for judicial assistance that are filed. Uh, at federal court in the United States. The United States is a very transparent system. And I've got this, you know, somewhat complicated monitoring uh, system, an expensive monitoring system set up, so I'm notified when any of these are in the, in the public domain. And um, so typically what will happen is if the UK is, is conducting an investigation, the evidence trail leads to the United States, the UK Central Authority will make a request of, of the US Central Authority, the Department of Justice. The Department of Justice will hand it over to the US Attorney in whatever district the evidence is believed to be held. And then the US Attorney makes uh, a formal application to the local court. And so there will be the application, and then typically attached to the application as an exhibit is the underlying request for assistance, which spells out the entire, you know, very often, like very specific details. Uh, about who is being investigated, the bank accounts being sought, the numbers of those bank accounts, and the cover note will say, please keep this confidential. You know, and the US Attorney sort of just slaps it on as, as an exhibit, the whole thing. And uh, there used to be a, something called the Wicket Team, the White Collar Crime Investigative Team, I think it was called. It was a joint US-UK initiative based in Miami. So they literally were sharing you know, office space. It was like some open plan office, you know, and, and the FBI here and, and, and British detectives there. And we published one of these things and the British police accused the FBI of leaking it to me, you know, even though I, I, I got it from, uh, from the court. Um, so what sort of trends are you noticing in the offshore world? You, you know, it, it, 
anything that uh, is worth commenting on that uh, so so I touched on it this morning the really just the, the you know the cyber the cryptocurrency the you know the the panel that was on after we spoke about the uh, really the the digital currency the, the you know the games and the, the second life and things like that um, you know those type of platforms again is something that we're we're very focused on as kind of the next wave of, of financial crime economic crime so I would say that that's definitely one I'd say also, you know, and I don't know, this may just be in the U.S., but just the move from, you know, uh, away from sometimes really large financial institutions to smaller institutions, you know, in terms of AML systems, you know, uh, community banks, smaller banks, we see some, you know, trend to kind of moving in that direction away from the big banks. So. I'd very much echo that, particularly the, the, that last point around... Um, move away from the largest institutions? And if I could just add to that point, I talked about this this morning as well, that that's really it gets into the, the importance of kind of the grassroots work that we do, you know, not at my level, but at, but at every field office and to the extent we can internationally to educate everybody. But we, we do a lot of these, you know, smaller outreach forums with our private partners to try to get the community bankers in so we can help educate them on, on what it is we're looking for and, and what the trends that they may see criminals moving to their jurisdictions and banks. So. Um, the sort of highly publicized uh, actions against various Swiss banks, you know, I, what, what's it called, the, the Swiss bank program? Swiss bank program, yeah. so, so have you, you know, seen any trends, any client trends uh, uh, originating from that? You know, where did the money start leaving Switzerland and go somewhere else? I'm sure that's a, a question you would love me to answer, right? Well, <laughs> the, yeah. So I, can I can't tell you that. I mean, that's, but that is, that's what we do. I mean, this is, this is where you get into the value of the, all the information that we have. That's what we're interested in. And I am not going to mention specific jurisdictions, but we are mining all of that data. And it's not just that data, the Swiss bank data. It's, it's all of the offshore voluntary disclosures that came into the IRS. It's those, you know, many, many different data sets that we're interested in, in where, did, where did the money flow, you know, which, which countries. And, again, we're, we're agnostic to the country. We're just interested in following the flow of information and, and, and evidence in our investigation. So, Yes, you know, I'd love to have... A couple questions. Oh, have a question. Sorry. Go ahead, Cynthia. Oh, oh sorry. Hey, Masha. You're Masha, right? Yes, oh, I am Masha. Masha Spitzo from Vantage Intelligence. Um, so we are a lot of investigators in the room. And we would like to know how better to partner with you where we can provide information. Obviously, we come across a lot of information through our investigations. And a lot of the times, whether it's in the US, we have an office in the US and in London, whether it's um, now with unexplained wolf orders here, whether we can pass information to you that you can take, um, obviously, and take forward and investigate further. And obviously, there's going to be some consequences for the individual. Or the same with IRS. We've actually done a few cases where we're whistleblowers and we provide information to the IRS, but it's very one-way street, whereas we can actually provide a lot more once we know what else is needed, particularly on individuals that are un Russian, so for example, of Russian descent or Israeli descent or other countries that come to the US, the money is there and potentially they have green cards or they're citizens and so forth. How we can establish a relationship with you guys is beneficial for you as well, but it's also beneficial for us, both from the whistleblower's perspective, but also some of our clients actually being on the other side and being defrauded by certain individuals who want, for the lack of a better word, revenge. So they would like to see something happening to these individuals. Is there any advice you can offer? I, I'll just say, uh, you know, the, um, I feel the frustration. But it is, it is completely a one-way street because that's the way the law is set up in the U.S. And, it, and, it's, and I know it frustrates you. Um, we can't share that even with our law enforcement partners. That, that tax, you know, the tax and tax return from information, um, you know, the, the disclosure restrictions and laws around that. So we're, we're constantly, um, we're interested in information. So we, you know, we can probably talk further about how we get that. But the problem is you can give us reams and reams of information I can't give you anything back. I can't tell you, 
you know, you may be contacted later by an investigator that says, hey, you know, can I get some additional information on this lead? But we can't tell you that we opened a case, we did this, we did that. So it is, you know, again, it's, that's just the way, it's not because we don't desire to share it, we just, we're not allowed to share that information at all. Um, I'm, I'm very interested in, um, you know, obviously international combating offshore tax evasion. That's, you know, that's, that's why I'm here, that's why I traveled from the U.S. Um, it's an area that I think we can do more work in. And I think, again, what you're getting at is a point I've made a couple times is our, our interactions with our private partners, folks that can provide us information, I think we can do more in that area. But to also recognize that there's a finite number of investigators that I have and a finite number of cases that we're going to be able to work. So all the information that you give us is not necessarily going to result in an investigation. So, so we would take a slightly different position, but it is slightly different. <clears throat> we will, so I'll just to say where we are, we do a lot of work with the financial sector now. We have a joint structure with the banking sector, and that is the two-way exchange of intelligence, and that is designed to get material into law enforcement to drive law enforcement activity, but equally to get law enforcement material out into the banking sector to drive better risk assessment, better judgment, and to get money out of the system or prevent it getting into the system. We will do more of that on a, <clears throat> on a trend basis, rather than, but we will do some on an individual or a corporate structure or a set of corporate structures. We will pass that kind of information, but that's because we have a structured relationship. We have information sharing agreements, and our preferred position would be to do that with um, trade or professional bodies or groups of organization rather than that we will not, will not provide direct in feedback on a sort of individual company basis. We will take, we'll take absolutely in the same position as Don, we'll take information from anyone. Um, so you can, you know, my, you know, from my perspective, um, anything that comes into to me will go straight into our, um, to our intelligence capability and we will take that information, we'll use it and we'll contact people and we'll follow up on it but we do want to do more in terms of building those kind of intelligence sharing structures. We've done it with the banking sector, we're looking at the moment about how to engage that more effectively with accountancy and insurance and um, more into the private wealth world so we're looking to do more in that space now. Um, we expect to push that quite hard over the next 12 months. Yeah, sure. Just in terms of the um, move to open up some of the beneficial ownership registries, um, have you seen, this is kind of tied in with David's question, but have you seen a move to certain jurisdictions or, or move away from um, well-known jurisdictions such as the BBI or Cayman Islands, for, for instance, into other jurisdictions that are harder to trace? Uh, from our perspective, I think, I think at this stage, too early to say. Too early for us to make any substantive judgment that we'd actually want, want to put out there at the moment. What I would say um, is that we are certainly getting good cooperation from the best-known jurisdictions. Uh, and what has been interesting, I think, in the unexplained wealth order space has been that we are clearly, we are clearly being looked at because we have been approached on occasions by people um, or by their representatives um, suggesting that they are concerned that we, were look we will be looking for an unexplained wealth order and they'd quite like to talk to us in advance of any such application. See, I mean, I would love, uh, you know, I really would love uh, if, if I, I was a mind reader and I could sort of figure out what's going on. Because, you know, my experience is that, you know, the offshore centers are, are, are with, with me, so members of the public, they are not cooperative. I'll give you another example. You know, pretty much each week I send researchers to uh, the Bermuda Supreme Court, the High Court of the British Virgin Islands, and the Grand Court of the Cayman Islands to obtain the publicly available writs. So Bermuda illegally denied the public access to writs for over 40 years. Uh, 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 and uh, the Chief Justice, uh, who recently uh, left as Chief Justice, Ian Cawley, 
who I've known, you know, since I lived in Bermuda when he was uh, an attorney with a very small law firm, he, he issued a ruling that um, these had been illegally uh, uh, withheld from the public for 40 years, and he made them uh, publicly available as of December the 1st, 2016, I think it was, could have been 2015, 2016. Um, but despite that, uh, and it, he didn't make it retroactive, you know, they're not retroactively available, it's just anything from that date. And his argument is that anyone filing a, a document before that date did so you know, mistakenly, as it turns out, in the belief that these wouldn't be made public. But Bermuda Supreme Court is, it, it, the administrative side is a complete mess, so even though these documents, these writs, or other forms of originating process are supposed to be available now. Uh, in reality, it will, uh, many of them still aren't, and even the ones that the court, uh, at the discretion of whoever is behind the counter on any given day, decides uh, whether you're actually entitled to something or not, and even if you are, it takes many, many weeks. The Grand Court of the Cayman Islands, um, I've you know, Offshore Alerts had a few public spats with uh, the Chief Justice, uh, uh, Anthony Smelly, um, because uh, after years of seamlessly sending somebody to the court, getting loads of documents, publishing them, decided he had a problem with this. And he's tried various ways to stop Offshore Alert doing it. They banned copying at the court. Uh, which I believe was illegal, so I started publicly saying that you know, this seems to be illegal. Uh, he immediately rescinded the ban on copying. Then he increased the fees substantially, but we kept paying them. I mean, we give that court in fees thousands and thousands of dollars. And then more recently, I, I just discovered that we were getting fewer and fewer documents, and the court um, basically... Uh, just decided to stop making um, dozens and dozens and dozens of documents on an annual basis uh, available. And um, we, it got to the point where 50% of all financial services division cases were filed under seal. So under seal means there was just no public record. No entry anywhere that these even existed. Several of them were winding up petitions against companies that were publicly listed in the United States of America. I mean, just think about that. You've got people buying and selling shares in a company that's subject to a winding up order in the Cayman Islands, which is its domicile, and the Cayman Islands court is concealing this information. So, you know, I wrote a story about this. The Cayman court just denied, they wouldn't, respond to my request for information, a local newspaper, the Cayman Compass, followed it up. And the court just basically lied to them. And they said, no, that's not the case. We're not sealing these documents. They're available. They said, uh, I think they said something like, uh, it was only 3% of uh, financial services division cases that year had been sealed. The, the reality was it was something like you know, 15, 16, 17%. And over the preceding two months, it, it was 50%. You know? And they just lied, but they immediately made them available. You know, so, you know, I sent somebody back down to the court and they spent, you know, thousands of dollars because we had to make up for all of these cases. But many of them were winding up uh, petitions. And, 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 you know, it's, it's important, you know, as investigators to understand, and this is why I'd love to know what they're, whether they really are cooperating with you guys, because my experience is registered agents saying you're not entitled to information, me getting involved, they immediately give it to us because it's public, giving me false information, giving me incomplete information, and quite frankly, acting like, you know, they just want to be left alone. You know, so I am very curious as to whether that's how they actually behave in private. Hi. The BVI, by the way, well, I've had no problems with the BVI. I, I highly recommend the BVI. I've, I've not had any transparency problems. For Cayman or Bermuda. I'm from the Bahamas. Yeah. But since we have a, a system which we basically inherited from Great Britain, I find it hard to believe that if a writ is filed, it's a document that you can't get a copy. 
or you can see the red. Now you talk, you talk about uh, winding up petitions and so forth. Procedurally, maybe you were wrong because it could be that those proceedings are deemed proceedings in chambers. And to that extent, they concern the parties involved. And so you can't get access to records and without the leave of the court. I don't know what's happening. No, no, that wasn't I, the I case. I find it very strange that yeah. you, you were unable to, to but, see a copy of the writ. Well, I, I, I was able to, but only after exposing the practices of the court, and they immediately made them available. I mean, this, this is well, well documented, and I actually, um, in, you know, just so you, you know, I'm very uh, clinical in how I go about my job. Before we publish a story, I asked a local journalist with the Cayman Compass to go to the court just to confirm that, you know, what I was saying was accurate. And they were all sealed. Uh, and then they were immediately unsealed after I exposed them, and then they lied to the Cayman Compass. So there's so many issues here where, you know, a court lying blatantly to, to the media, that's dangerous territory. I am not saying that that didn't happen, but it's just yeah. for me. I would if, uh, yeah, that's why I wrote a story about it. I it, have it, been it. a registrar of our Supreme Court. Yeah. And in, while I was here, that never happened. But, but we're not talking about the Bahamas, though, you know? This, this, I, I so, so the Bermuda problem is one of administration. You know, like 50% of the uh, positions at Bermuda Supreme Court are, are unfilled. I mean, it's, it's incredible. The Chief Justice, when he retired, in his speech said, listen, this has to be addressed. Half of all positions at Bermuda Supreme Court are, are, are unfilled. Uh, so it, it's more, in Bermuda, the problem, well, one, they illegally denied access for all this time. But now, now that access is supposed to be given, they just don't have the staff, they don't have the system. Um, there's like mold in the building that they have, yeah, I can remember they got evacuated from the building for some time. It just seems to be a disaster zone. In the Cayman Islands, um, they do have uh, the system in place, but the Chief Justice, for whatever reason, got a bee in his bonnet, uh, even accused Offshore Alert of breaching copyright. You know, there's no copyright of writs. You know, they're filed with the court. Anyone can go and uh, you know, pay a statutory fee, and these writs are by law to be given to them, right? So he, he tried to claim that we were breaching the copyright of the attorneys who, who wrote the writs. But let's even say, let's say we were. Um, nobody has made a complaint. There's no pending suit before his court where he can hear evidence from all parties. He's already made up his mind, you know. But, but it goes to the mentality that exists offshore where they do not want to give you any information. Yeah. I, I am not in a position, and I'm not trying to contradict you in any way, but for me, I do not understand it. Because a writ is simply one of four means of commencing civil proceedings. By writ, petition, originating summons or motion. And I do not know of a case where you cannot have sight of a writ. I just don't understand that personally. Yeah. But I am not in a position to No, I don't understand it either, yeah. But trust me, everything I've said, I, I can, you know, prove. You know, but 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 it just it's just you know it, it goes to and, and offshore centers are are different. You know, it is a, a myth that they're all the same. Uh, there are you know different uh, levels of of, of quality um, and uh, professionalism and you know transparency and everything else. Um, and, and another thing that I, I want to talk about is uh, I've noticed as an investigative journalist is a rise in low rent fund vehicles. So a, um, a trend offshore is to, uh, and many offshore centers have done this, and they go by a variety of names, these vehicles, special portfolio companies, special purpose companies. But the, they're, they're all essentially the same where, you know, 10 years ago, if you wanted to set up a hedge fund in, in the Cayman Islands, for example, or Malta, um, it would be an expensive process. You would need to be licensed. You would need to meet capital requirements. In recent years, these, these uh, different jurisdictions have passed essentially the same vehicle but with different names, and it's basically the crea creation of a mother, um, a mother company, and then it has tentacles that are all unincorporated, and these tentacles are unrelated to each other, and 
Um, the mothership will be licensed, will meet the, uh, the, the, the capital requirements, but these tentacles are basically funds, but they're not legally incorporated vehicles, and pretty much anyone with a couple of hundred bucks can operate one of these tentacles, and you know, which, which they do, and they go out and seek to raise money, and I've investigated many of these, and they are, you know, many of them are overtly fraudulent. Um, there's one group in uh, Malta called the Argentarius Group. This guy, you know, Liechtenstein is considered to be uh, a jurisdiction. You know, we've got a session actually taking place right now about Liechtenstein, and, and there's evidence which I am familiar with where um, the wealthiest, uh, he's one of the wealthiest, I mean, the guy's super, super duper wealthy, is, is an attorney and a corporate service provider where uh, he was setting up. Uh, uh, you know, uh, asset protection structures for, for wealthy clients. You know, don't tell anyone about it. And, of course, when the wealthy client, the settlor, died, right, nobody knew about it apart from uh, the fiduciary in, in Liechtenstein who was just transferring all the assets to himself. I mean, the guy's worth hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, um, so, so, anyway, the Argentiris group, the guy who runs as is uh, uh, an Austrian called Andreas Wolfel, Prior to going to Malta, he was kicked out of Liechtenstein, right? That's how bad this is. And the Argentiris group runs these ETIs, exchange-traded instruments, and they are basically me, you, you know, anyone off the street for uh, little money down can run a, 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 an investment fund with really no money behind it. And, you just, and, they, and they just all, you know, the people who are running these funds, the ones that I've investigated, are just committing fraud. And uh, they haven't, the group hasn't filed their accounts for the Argentarius group with Malta, which, you know, is quite transparent in terms of online records. They haven't filed accounts for something like three or four years. Uh, they fired their auditor, uh, uh, a couple of times, but yet you know they're, they're still in business. But anyway, that is a trend of, of, of these sort of low rent uh, uh, fund uh, vehicles, many of which will, will be collapsing, uh, uh, you know, on an ongoing basis. So, do we have any other? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, gentlemen. Um, sorry, uh, Ewan Grant Institute for Statecraft. Uh, my question is for both of you, and it's about um, beneficial ownership and ultimate beneficial ownership. Uh, how much is being generated and usable about ultimate beneficial ownership? And given that there may not be a lot that can be done about ultimate, because the chains are often so long, but the fact that there is a long chain certainly gives alarm bells. Uh, do you have any comments on progress on that part of UBO? And also, are you getting increases in qualitative and quantitative proactive um, submission of information to yourselves, which isn't necessarily a request from another jurisdiction, but more along the lines of, I think you might be interested in this. Thank you. So, uh, you know, again, I hate to give the same answer, but it just, it varies by jurisdiction. I think we have had some success in the, ulti you know, ultimate beneficial ownership, but I, you know, being a, a representative of the government, I can't give you that specific information. So it, it, it varies across the board. Obviously, it's something we're very interested in. You know, any, any information we get on the ultimate beneficial owners, but just I can't really provide any specific information. So, so from a UK perspective, certainly um, in the work we've been doing around potential unexplained wealth orders, civil recovery, that kind of space, we've had quite a lot of information that has taken us to ultimate beneficial owner. Um, but I think we have to recognize that the likelihood is that the better the better we do in terms of obtaining cooperation and information, the the likelier it is that there will be a response by by 
moving to those jurisdictions where it is more difficult for us to get access to the information. The question then comes for us, particularly, I think, and it's particularly relevant in that civil space, about the, the inferences that, that the court may draw if we go for unexplained wealth orders and point out the, the complexity of a chain or the, or the use of particular jurisdictions. Do we have any more questions? Talking about unexplained health orders, um, can you talk a little bit about logistics of how long, I know this is very new and this has only been implemented in February, um, and I think the news came recently last week that there was a first woman who was um, we, basically all over, the, the name was disclosed, it was um, it became public, I think it was an Azerbaijani lady. Um, can, you, can you give us a little bit more flavor on what actually happens behind the closed doors if it's possible? <coughs> How long does the process go? How the exchange of information goes between the, the target of the unexplained wealth order and, and you, and what's requested, who participates in this, if it's possible at all? I can try and give a little, but, um, but as you say, it's new, and there, there, in terms of there being um, sufficient data to give a real sense of timing, that's quite difficult. Um, so from our perspective, we, ha we will go to court at a point where we are able, essentially, to... to, to demonstrate three points. Um, the, that the individual we're looking at is covered by a UWO, i.e. they are a non-European economic area politically exposed person. Or we can demonstrate that on the balance of probability they are linked to serious and organized crime. That we are able to link them to six, two specific assets. That in itself, of course, is, an, is a difficult step, and that takes us straight into the, um, the benefit of ownership point. Um, and that we are unable, on the back of reasonable inquiries, reasonable to be interpreted, um, to identify a legitimate source of income by which they have acquired the assets. So we have to, we have to address those three issues to get in front of the courts. The timing thereafter is very much a matter for the High Court. Um, if the High Court wishes to make, uh, wishes to agree with us or our application, makes an unexplained wealth order and usually an interim freezing order alongside that to prevent any dissipation of the assets, then, then we are very much in the hands of the court around the future timetable. Where we are at the moment with the case that you referred to um, in relation to the lady from Azerbaijan, um, the, the High Court was very clear. Um, that the unexplained wealth order was granted, that, um, that the points that were challenged were dismissed by the High Court. Um, we, we wait to hear whether the Court of Appeal decides to hear those points separately. And subsequent to that, um, no doubt if... Uh, well, we think it extremely likely if the Court of Appeal does hear and maintains the position of the High Court, i.e. in our favour, then we would expect that probably to go to the Supreme Court. Um, so timetable in this space is absolutely open to question. We have, we have a number of other cases in the pipeline. Um, we are well into three figures in terms of the number of people we've looked at for this. And what happens with the property? I guess it relates to real estate property, for example. So if the freeze and order is given, as the court approves it, so that for the whole time of, of this process, it's just frozen, the properties are frozen, they're not, uh, or is it just properties or any companies that they're not allowed to transfer shares and how far it's, it's It is very wide ranging. So it is, um, so what they cannot do is, um, is dissipate the value of the property. Um, and that doesn't matter whether we're talking about, about um, physical property, corporate assets, um, or, um, or cash, for Art. example. Uh, yep, certainly theoretically, yes. Hmm. Do we have any insolvency practitioners in the room? Are there any? Because uh, Offshore Alert will be drumming up some business for you um, uh, probably the beginning of December. So... Offshore centers are really big into uh, blockchain technology. Um, many of them are passing you know, laws, regulations, and trying to attract this business. And, and at the forefront of this is, is Bermuda. 
and um, I uh, obtained, you know, sometimes with some difficulty, but the share registers of every single blockchain related company because they're like uh, they're under a special category uh, that's registered in Bermuda so as of a couple of months ago there were over 20 of them and two of them are uh, overtly fraudulent and they're actually the two most prominent um, blockchain crypto companies uh, in Bermuda one is called the Ula La U U L A L A and the other one is Arbitrade and the people behind both of these unrelated groups that have gone to Bermuda are um, North Americans, mainly uh, Americans and some Canadians. And in each, for each group, the background of several of the individuals who are directors and or shareholders is one of bankruptcies, judgments, lawsuits alleging fraud in their, you know, throughout their careers prior to forming this in Bermuda. I mean, they are overt scams, and we will be exposing these probably the beginning of December, and based on the history of Offshore Alert, it will typically take, I would say, no more than two months before they go into liquidation. So... Uh, you know, we have drummed up a lot of business for insolvency practitioners who attend our conferences, so long may that continue. Because, you know, uh, Offshore Alert's job is to put these uh, crooks out of business, and then, uh, you know, the people in attendance can make some, you know, money by, you know, liquidating and uh, investigating on behalf of the liquidators. So, okay, I think that's it. Thank you very much.